Genesis were a scholarly tome, the myth of Lot would be a fascinating footnote, a delightful digression from the main narrative, drawing inspiration from the earlier tales of Noah. This narrative offers a fiery reboot, perhaps in response to God's vow to abstain from aquatic annihilation. Could it be that Lot's very existence in this tale serves as an etiological explanation for the origins of the Moabites and Ammonites, nations later portrayed as adversaries of the Israelites? While Abraham heeds God's call to venture into unknown territories, he curiously brings along his nephew Lot. Abraham's journey underscores the virtue of unwavering faith in divine decrees, even when faced with seemingly insurmountable odds. In this exposition, I aim to elucidate the mythical nature of Lot's tale, which by extension encompasses Abraham. Drawing parallels with other ancient myths featuring divine visitations and cataclysmic destructions, I hope to illuminate the allegorical essence of the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. By the video's conclusion, I trust you'll appreciate the narrative artistry of this ancient tale. Now let's delve deep into the enigma that is Lot's legacy. Lot's Role The story of Lot, Abraham's nephew, sheds light on Israel's early history. When God calls Abraham to leave his homeland and go to Canaan, Abraham takes Lot along, even though God told Abraham to leave his relatives behind. This hints that Abraham doubts God's promise to give him many descendants since his wife Sarah is unable to have children. Bringing Lot seems like a backup plan. Once in Canaan, Abraham and Lot become rich and their herdsmen start fighting over land. Abraham generously lets Lot choose which land he wants. Lot picks the fertile Jordan Valley outside of Canaan. This suggests Lot could be Abraham's heir, but God then promises Abraham the land will go to his offspring, not Lot's. Later, Lot gets captured in a raid on Sodom where he lives. Abraham risks his life to save Lot. This wouldn't have been necessary if Abraham had obeyed God and left Lot behind. Before destroying Sodom for its wickedness, God discusses it with Abraham. Knowing Abraham's nephew lives there, Abraham persuades God not to sweep sweep away the righteous with the wicked, but he can't mention Lot's name without admitting his earlier disobedience. In the end, God spares Lot because of Abraham, not due to Abraham's argument. After Sodom's destruction, Lot's daughters get him drunk and trick him into fathering their children, afraid they are the last survivors. This leads to Israel's enemies Moab and Ammon being born. So while Lot was righteous in Sodom, his presence in Canaan due to Abraham's disobedience led to future conflict for Abraham's descendants. The story contrasts Abraham's heir coming through God's promise and Lot's heirs coming through deceit. This is a general recap of Lot from the Anchor Bible Dictionary, but what I found missing was the comparative myth of theoxony in this scholarly work. What is theoxony? you say. Theoxony, or theoxenia, is a theme in Greek mythology in which human beings demonstrate their virtue or piety by extending hospitality to a humble stranger, Sinos who turns out to be disguised as a deity, Theos, with the capacity to bestow rewards. In the scholarly realm of mythology and ritual, Theoxony refers to the gracious hosting of deities by mere mortals, often over a sumptuous feast. Homer's epics depict gods mingling at sacrifices, and in the Odyssey, they even traverse the earth incognito, assessing the ethical fiber of humanity. This narrative seed blossoms into the quintessential Theoxony tale. A deity either welcomed or spurned later reveals their divine identity and bestows blessings or retributions accordingly. The tragic tale of Pentheus exemplifies the consequences of a botched Theoxenic encounter counter. While triumphant instances underpin the origins of numerous cults, notably those of Demeter and Dionysus, within these tales, the mortal host often ascends to heroic status, having been enlightened by the god and subsequently inaugurating the cult or pioneering innovations 
like viticulture, which is harvesting and cultivating grapes. The Homeric hymn to Demeter recounts Demeter's reception at Eleusis, a tell tinged with both triumph and tribulation. Yet the most iconic rendition of this motif, likely rooted in local lore, is the poignant tale of Bacchus and Philemon. I see lots of Greek stories using the Theoxony motif, but a far older account in Mesopotamia with elements of Theoxony is the Poor Man of Nippur. It's an Akkadian story dating from around 1500 BCE. It is attested by only three texts, only one of which is more than a small fragment. What I'm suggesting is that these mythical elements of divine visitors among mortals who treat strangers hospitable or disrespectful spans back to the earliest civilizations with writing. However, none of these extremely ancient narratives looks remotely close to the comparisons made between the Bible and the Greek myths. I want to turn our attention to two fascinating myths documented by Ovid, Publius Ovidius Naso, 21st of March 43 BC to AD 17 or 18 is his life. He was a Roman poet who lived during the reign of Caesar Augustus. Let's take a look at these two stories written by Ovid, one in his Metamorphosis and the other in his Fasti. Transformations, or Metamorphosis, is a long poem written in 8 CE by the famous Roman writer Ovid. Many consider it his best work. It tells the story of the world from the very beginning to when Julius Caesar became a god, using over 250 legends. It's a big poem with 15 parts and almost 12,000 lines. While it feels like an epic tale, it's unique because it changes its mood and topics a lot. Ovid was inspired by other stories about transformations, but he added his own twist to them. Let's dive into Ovid's stories and the Bible, compare them, and chat about what we find. Bacchus and Philemon. And at this point, the river said no more. This wonderful event astonished all, but one was there, Ixion's haunty son, a known despiser of the living gods, who laughing scorned it as an idle tale. He made a jest of those who heard and said, a foolish fiction, Iculus. How can such a tale be true? Do you believe a god there is in heaven so powerful, a god to give and take away a form, transform, created shapes? Such impious words found no response in those who heard him speak. Amazed, he could so doubt known truth before them all, uprose to vindicate the gods, the hero Lelix, wise in length of days. The glory of the living gods, he said, is not diminished, nor their power confined, and whatsoever they decree is done. And I have this to tell, for all must know the evil of such words. Upon the hills of Phrygia, I have seen two sacred trees, a lime tree and an oak, so closely grown their branches interlace. A low stone wall is built around to guard them from all harm, and that you may not doubt it. I declare again, I saw the spot for Pythias. There he sent me to attend his father's court. Nearby those trees are stagnant pools and fens, where coots and camarants delight to haunt. But it was not so always. Long ago, t'was visited by mighty Jupiter, together with his nimble-witted son, who first had laid aside his rod and wings. As weary travelers over all the land, they wandered begging for their food and bed. And for a thousand houses, all the doors were bolted, and no word of kindness given. So wicked were the people of that land. At last, by chance, they stopped at a small house, whose humble roof was thatched with reeds and straw, and here a kind old couple greeted them. The good dame Bacchus seemed about the age of old Philemon, her devoted man. They had been married in their early youth, in that same cottage, and had lived in it, and grown together to a good old age. Contented with their lot because they knew their property and felt no shame of it. They had no need of servants. The good pair were masters of their home and served themselves. Their own commands they easily obeyed. Now when the two gods Jove and Mercury had reached their cottage, 
and with bending necks had entered the low door, the old man bade them rest their wearied limbs and set a bench on which his good wife Bacchus threw a cloth. And then with kindly bustle, she stirred up the glowing embers on the hearth and then laid tender leaves and bark and bending down breathed on them with her ancient breath until they kindled into flame. Then from the house, she brought a bundle of sticks and small twigs and broken branches and above them swung a kettle, not too large for simple folk. And all this done, she stripped some cabbage leaves, which her good husband gathered for the mill. Then with a two pronged fork, the man let down a rusty side of bacon from a loft and cut a little portion from the chine, which had been cherished long. He softened it in boiling water. All the while they tried with cheerful conversation to beguile, so none might notice a brief loss of time. Swung on a peg, they had a beechwood trough, which quickly with warm water filled, was used for comfortable washing, and they fixed up a willow couch, cushioned soft of springy sedge, on which they neatly spread a well-worn cloth preserved so many years. Twas only used used on rare and festive days, and even it was coarse and very old, though not unfit to match a willow couch. Now as the gods reclined, the good old dame, whose skirts were tucked up, moving carefully, for so she tottered with her many years, fetched a clean table for the ready mill, but one leg of the table was too short, and so she wedged it with a potsherd, so made firm, she cleanly scoured it with fresh mint, and here is set the double-tented fruit of chaste Minerva, and the tasty dish of corner, autumn picked and pickled. These were served for relish, and the endive green and radishes surrounding a large pot of curdled milk, and eggs not overdone but gently turned in glowing embers, all served up in earthen dishes, then sweet wine served up in clay so costly, all embossed in cups of beechwood smoothed with yellow wax. So now they had short respite till the fire might yield the heated course. Again they served new wine, but mellow, and a second course, sweet nuts, dried figs, and wrinkled dates and plums, and apples fragrant in wide baskets heaped, and in a wreath of grapes from purple vines, concealed almost a glistening honeycomb, and all these orchard dainties were enhanced by willing service and congenial smiles. But while they served, the wine bowl often drained, as often was replenished, though unfilled, and Bacchus and Philemon, full of fear, as they observed the wine spontaneous well, increasing when it should diminish, raised their hands in supplication, and implored indulgence for their simple home and fare. And now persuaded by this strange event, such visitors were deities unknown. This aged couple, anxious to bestow their most esteemed possession, hastily began to chase the only goose they had, the faithful guardian of their little home, which they would kill and offer to the gods. But swift of wing, at last it wearied them, and fled for refuge to the smiling gods. At once the deities forbade their zeal and said, A righteous punishment shall fall severe upon this wicked neighborhood. But by the might of our divinity, no evil shall befall this humble home. But you must come and follow as we climb the summit of this mountain. Both obeyed and leaning on their staves, toiled up the steep, not farther from the summit than the flight. Of one swift arrow from a hunter's howl, they paused to view their little home once more. And as they turned their eyes, they saw the fields around their own engulfed in a morass, although their own remained. And while they wept bewailing the sad fate of many friends, and wondering at the change they saw their home, so old and little for their simple need, put on new splendor, and as it increased, it changed into a temple of the gods, where first the frame was fashioned of rude stakes, columns of marble glistened, and the thatch gleamed golden in the sun, and legends carved adorned the doors, and all the ground shone white with marble rich, and after this was done, the son of Saturn said with gentle voice, Now tell us, good old man, and you his wife, worthy and faithful, what is your desire? Philemon counseled with old Bacchus first, and then discovered to the listening gods their heart's desire. We pray you let us have the care of your new temple, and since we have passed so many years in harmony, let us depart this life together. Let the same hour take us both. I would not see the tomb of my dear wife, and let me not be destined to be buried by her hands. At once their wishes were fulfilled. 
So long as life was granted, they were known to be the temple's trusted keepers. And when age had innervated them with many years, as they were standing by some chance before the sacred steps and were relating all these things as they had happened, Bacchus saw Philemon, her husband, and he too saw Bacchus as their bodies put forth leaves. And while the tops of trees grew over them above their faces, they spoke each to each. As long as they could speak, they said, farewell, farewell, my own. And while they said farewell, new leaves and branches covered both at once. The people of Tyana still point out two trees which grew there from a double trunk, two forms made into one. Old truthful men who have no reason to deceive me told me truly all that I have told you, and I have seen the votive wreaths hung from the branches of the hallowed double tree. And one time, as I hung the fresh garlands there, I said, those whom the gods care for are gods, and those who worshipped are now worshipped here. Ovid's Metamorphosis Book 8, 612. Now we are turning to Ovid's Fasti, which highlights another significant portion to the puzzle of Genesis. The calendar, or Fasti, is a poem by the famous Roman writer Ovid from around 8 AD. It's like a diary that talks about Roman holidays and their stories. Ovid couldn't finish it because he got in trouble with Emperor Augustus and was sent away. In the poem, Ovid acts like a reporter speaking to eyewitnesses who are chatting with Roman gods to find out the cool tales behind the holidays. Sometimes there's more than one story for a holiday. Hyrius and the birth of Orion in May. All the same, these three festivals occur about the same time, but not in succession on any intervening day. If in the middle of them you look for Boeotian Orion, you'll get it wrong. I must sing the reason for that constellation. Jupiter and his brother, who is king in the wide ocean, and Mercury, were traveling the roads together. It was the time when upturned plows are brought back by the yoked oxen and the lamb, head down drinks the milk of the well-filled ewe. By chance, an old man, Hyrius, farmer of a narrow plot, sees them as he was standing in front of his little cottage. And this is what he said. The way is long, but there isn't a long time left, and my door is open for strangers. He added a look to his words and asked a second time. They go along with his promises and do not reveal that they are gods. They pass under the old man's roof soiled with black smoke with his breath and brings out battered torches and chops them up. There are pots standing, the smaller held beans, the other herbs, and each froths closely covered by its lid. And while they wait, he gives red wine with a trembling hand. The god of ocean receives the first cup. As soon as he drained it, he said, now let the next to drink be Jupiter. The old man heard Jupiter and went white. When his wits have returned, he sacrifices the ox that tilled his poor field and roasts it on a great fire. And the wine he had once laid up as a boy in early years he brings out, stored in a smoky jar. No delay, they reclined on couches that concealed river sedge in linen, but were not high even so. The table gleamed now with a feast, now with Laius set there. The bowl was ready red earthenware, the cups were beach. Jupiter's words were, if anything occurs to you, wish for it, you'll gain it all. The mild man's words were, I had a dear wife, known to me in the spring of first youth. You ask where she is now, the urn covers her. To her I swore an oath, having called you to witness my words. You alone, I said, will be married to me. I said it, and I keep my word, but in fact, I have a different wish. I don't want to be a husband, and I do want to be a father. They had all nodded agreement. They had all stood by the hide of the ox. I'm ashamed to speak further. Then they covered the dripping hide by throwing earth on top, and now ten months, and a boy had been born. Hyrius calls him Urian, because that's how he was conceived. The first letter has lost its ancient sound. He had grown immensely. Delia took him as her companion. He was the guard of the goddess. He was her escort. Unthinking words moved the gods' anger. The wild beast I can't overcome, he said, doesn't exist. Earth sent in a scorpion. Its intent was to bring its crooked barbs against the goddess, mother of twins. Orion stood in its way. Latona added him to the shining stars and said, have the reward of what you deserve. Ovid Fasti, 
495 to 540. Oxford, world's classic. Now let's turn to Genesis. See if anything stands out. The Three Visitors, Genesis 18. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre, while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the earth. He said, If I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat, so you can be refreshed and then go on your way. Now that you have come to your servant, very well, they answered, do as you say. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. Quick, he said, get three sayas of our finest flour and knead it and bake some bread. Then he ran to the herd and selected a choice tender calf and gave it to a servant who hurried to prepare it. He then brought some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set these before them. While they ate, he stood near them under a tree. Where is your wife Sarah? They asked him. There, in the tent, he said. Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah your wife will have a son. Now, Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh. But he said, yes, you did laugh. When the men got up to leave, they looked down towards Sodom, and Abraham walked along with them to see them on their way. Then the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all the nations on earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sins so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. The men turned away and went towards Sodom, but Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? The Lord said, If I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Then Abraham spoke up again. Now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes, what if the number of the righteous is five less than 50? Will you destroy the whole city for the lack of five people? If I find 45 there, he said, I will not destroy it. Once again, he spoke to him. What if only 40 are found there? He said, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. Then he said, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak. What if only 30 can be found there? He answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. Abraham said, now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, what if only 20 can be found there? He said, For the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Then he said, May the Lord not be angry, but let me speak just once more. What if only 10 can be found there? He answered, For the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. When the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham, he left, and Abraham returned home. Two Visitors, Genesis 19. The two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gateway of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. He said, Please, my lords, turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you can rise early and go on your way. They said, No, we will spend the night in the square. But he urged them strongly. So they turned aside to him and entered his house. And he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. Then the men said to Lot, 
thought, have you anyone else here? Sons-in-law, sons, daughters, or anyone you have in the city? Bring them out of the place, for we are about to destroy this place, because the outcry against its people has become great before the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and said to his sons-in-laws, who were to marry his daughters, up, get out of this place, for the Lord is about to destroy the city. But he seemed to his sons-in-law to be jesting. When morning dawned, and the angels urged Lot, saying, Get up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or else you will be consumed in the punishment of the city. But he lingered. So the men seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand, the Lord being merciful to him. And they brought him out and left him outside the city. When they had brought them outside, they said, Flee for your life. Do not look back or stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the hills or else you will be consumed. Genesis 19. The stories are extremely close. Two angels, Genesis with Lot, or two gods, Ovid's Metamorphosis. The two were three in both previous stories. Abraham's three visitors and Hyresis, three visitors, come to visit a city in the guise of humans, and a pious man offers them hospitality. In Ovid's version, the details of the mill are described. The angels, or gods, reveal themselves and explain how, due to its inhabitants, the city will be destroyed, but that the pious couple will be spared and allowed to flee with them. In Genesis, the inhabitants of Sodom act perversely. They want to, quote, know the guests of Lot, meaning they want to rape them. Here, the descendants of Canaan are accused of inhospitality. Lot is ready to give them his own virgin daughters. We must keep in mind these details of Genesis 19, for they appear again in the story of Gibeah in Judges 19. Lot negotiates with the angels to allow him to find refuge in Zoar. His sons-in-laws from Sodom refuse to follow him. God destroys the city with fire, whereas the Roman story speaks of a flood. Philemon and Bacchus will become the keepers of a temple and eventually end their lives by merging together into a tree. The rest of Genesis 19 shows more parallels with Ovid. For example, Lot and his family are ordered to refrain from looking back at Sodom as they flee, also seen in the well-known story of Orpheus and Eurydice. They took the upward path through the still silence, steep and dark, shadowy with dense fog, drawing near to the threshold of the upper world. Afraid she was no longer there, and eager to see her, the lover turned his eyes. In an instant she dropped back, and he, unhappy man, stretching out his arms to hold her and be held, clutched at nothing but the receding air, dying a second time. Now there was no complaint to her husband. What then could she complain of, except that she had been loved? She spoke at last, farewell, that now scarcely reached his ears, and turned again towards that same place. Ovid, Metamorphosis Book 10, also see Virgil. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven, and he overthrew those cities, and all the plain, and all the inhabitants of the cities, and what grew on the ground. But Lot's wife behind him looked back. She became a pillar of salt. Genesis 19. The motif of a woman who is lost because either she or her companion looked back is found in both the Bible and Ovid. The last episode of Lot's story is his act of incest with his two daughters. They made him drunk and slept with him alternatively. The first daughter gave birth to Moab, ancestor of the Moabites. The second daughter gave birth to Ben-Ami, ancestor of the Ammonites, in Genesis 19. A very similar story is again found in Ovid's Metamorphosis. Mira, daughter of King Cinerus of Cyprus, had fallen in love with her father. As she could not repress these feelings, she confessed them to her nurse, and the two of them plotted to inebriate him to the extent that he would not recognize the woman with whom he was going to lie. Mira slept with her father twelve nights in a row, yet on the last night he discovered her identity and wanted to kill her. She fled and transformed, at a metamorphosis, into a mere tree, later giving birth to the god Adonis. Ovid Metamorphosis Book 10 in Ovid's Metamorphosis Book 10, the tales of Orpheus and Mira are intriguingly sequenced similarly to the biblical counterparts, albeit interspersed with unrelated narratives. In Genesis 18 and 19, while three angels are initially mentioned, only two venture to Sodom, mirroring Ovid's depiction where, of the three gods at Orion's birth, Jupiter, Neptune, and Mercury, only Jupiter and Mercury visit Philemon and Bacchus's city. The narrative of Lot 
parallels Philemon and Bacchus until their city exit. While the latter duo finds safety, Lot's wife faces a tragic fate reminiscent of Eurydice and Lot's daughter's actions echo Mira's. These parallels suggest a shared origin, possibly from the Hellenistic period. Some posit Ovid's influence might stem from Nicander of Colophon, though his works are lost. Most classicists suggest that Ovid is inspired by the works of Callimachus. I think it's necessary we highlight this man for a moment. Callimachus, circa 310 to 240 BCE, was an ancient Greek poet, scholar, and librarian who was active in Alexandria during the 3rd century BCE. E. A representative of ancient Greek literature of the Hellenistic period, he wrote over 800 literary works in a wide variety of genres, most of which did not survive. He espoused an aesthetic philosophy known as Kalamachianism, which exerted a strong influence on the poets of the Roman Empire and through them on all subsequent Western literature. He came under the patronage of King Ptolemy II Philadelphus and was employed at the Library of Alexandria where he compiled the Pinnax, a comprehensive catalog of all Greek literature. He was writing around the same time the Septuagint was created according to the letter of Aristius to Philocrates, which is a Hellenistic work of the 3rd or early 2nd century BC. CE, considered by some biblical scholars to be pseudepigraphal. The letter is the earliest text to mention the Library of Alexandria. Josephus, who paraphrases about two-fifths of the letter, ascribes it to Aristius of Marmara and to have been written to a certain Philocrates. The letter describes the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible by 72 interpreters sent into Egypt from Jerusalem at the request of the Librarian of Alexandria, resulting in the Septuagint translation. Some scholars have since argued that it is fictitious. Could Callimachus or some Greek authors influenced these Bible authors who put final touches on these Genesis narratives? These classicists also recognize that the Philemon and Bacchus story in Ovid reflects elements of the Callimachus narratives of Hecle and Atia. It seems rather obvious that Ovid didn't lift his tales from the Bible, but the overlaps in comparisons are so strikingly similar that one has to wonder, are they working off a common source, or did the Bible authors find inspiration of the stories from the Greeks to craft their genesis, Abraham and Lot, Theoxeny and Theophany. Some scholars suggest that the Ovid story mentions Phrygia as the location of the Philemon and Bacchus myth. Could it be possible that stories from the Old Testament were familiar in Hellenistic Phrygia and influenced local folktales? Historical records from Josephus indicate that Antiochus III, around 242 to 187 BC, relocated 2,000 Jewish families from from Mesopotamia and Babylonia to regions like Lydia and Phrygia. Notably, the tale of Philemon Bacchus is set in Lydia's core region. While some question the authenticity of Antiochus's letter, as presented by Josephus, ensuring the Jewish settlers their rights and traditions, it's undeniable that these Jewish communities were established in Lydia and Phrygia during Antiochus's reign. Their significant numbers suggest they were likely influential in their new surroundings. It's also very likely that this Phrygian tell made a big impact on the Jewish communities and they incorporated it into their Genesis myth. Scholars have largely overlooked the similarities between the Philemon Bacchus narrative and certain Old Testament stories. While Hollis is a particular scholar on this, provides a comprehensive analysis of the Philemon Bacchus background, he briefly touches upon potential Jewish influences on the tale. Galinsky vaguely notes the connection between the Philemon Bacchus story and some biblical themes, attributing it to the inherent religious nature of the myth. However, a few have been more direct in their observations. A scholar named H.T. Riley draws a parallel between the fate of Philemon and Bacchus' inhospitable neighbors and the biblical tale of Sodom and Gomorrah's destruction. He also suggests that the hospitality shown by Philemon and Bacchus to Jupiter and Mercury might be inspired by Abraham's reception of the angels. Franz Bomer hints, at possible Jewish influences on the Philemon Bacchus story, but overlooks C.C. Bushnell's article that details the links with Genesis 18 to 19. To summarize, there are notable parallels between the Philemon Bacchus narrative and the story of Sodom and Gomorrah in the Bible. Here's a graph that I'm showing you on the screen 
that it gives a good visual representation of these parallels between Genesis 18 and 19 to Ovid's Metamorphosis and Fasti. First, we have at dusk two angels arrive in Sodom. In Ovid, at dusk two gods, Jupiter and Mercury, arrive in a region of Phrygia. Lot's home welcomes and offers them sustenance. Bacchus and Philemon's home welcomes and offers them sustenance. Lot washes their feet and they share a meal. Bacchus and Philemon wash their feet and they share a meal. The residents of Sodom demand to confront the visitors. The residents of the region do not welcome the visitors. The angels blind the men of Sodom who surround Lot's house. The wine jug in Bacchus and Philemon's home refills itself. Their identities are revealed as angels. Their identities are revealed as gods, Jupiter and Mercury. Due to the wickedness of Sodom, it is set to be destroyed. Due to the wickedness of the region, it is set to be destroyed. Lot and his family are spared due to his hospitality. Bacchus and Philemon are spared due to their hospitality. Lot and his family are told to flee to the mountains. Bacchus and Philemon are told to flee to nearby mountains. Lot hesitates and the angels have to seize his hand to lead them out. Bacchus and Philemon struggle to reach the safety of the mountain. Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed by rain of fire and sulfur. Rain of fire and sulfur. The region is destroyed by a flood. Lot's wife looks back at the burning cities. Bacchus and Philemon look back to see their region submerged, but their home is elevated. Only Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities of the plain, are destroyed. Only the specific region around Bacchus and Philemon's home is destroyed. Lot is saved and his lineage continues through his daughters. Bacchus and Philemon are granted a wish and choose to be priest and to die at the same moment. Lot's wife turns into a pillar of salt. Bacchus and Philemon are transformed into trees growing side by side. Here's another parallel chart highlighted in an article called Crime and Punishment in Sodom and Gomorrah by Paul Davidson, who has a YouTube channel you should subscribe to called The Inquisitive Bible Reader. Links are in the description. Look at the graph with me, again paralleling both stories. Three divine beings, Yahweh and two angels traveling through the countryside, arrive at Abraham's tent. Three divine beings, Jupiter, Neptune, and Mercury, traveling through the countryside, arrive at the cottage of Hyrius. The place is distinctive for its sacred oak trees. The place is distinctive for its sacred trees, including an oak. The visitors' divine identities are a secret. The visitors' divine identities are a secret. Abraham, an old man, offers them hospitality. Hyrius, an old man, offers them hospitality. Abraham and Sarah prepare a feast for the visitors, including a slaughtered calf. Hyrius prepares a feast for the visitors, including a slaughtered ox. Yahweh reveals his identity. Jupiter reveals his identity. Abraham and Sarah desire a child, but Sarah is barren and old. Hyrius desires a child, but his wife is deceased. Yahweh promises that Sarah will have a child. Jupiter performs a miracle so that Hyrius will have a child. A set time later, Isaac is born. Ten months later, Orion is born. Two divine beings, angels, arrive at Sodom. Two divine beings, Jupiter and Mercury, arrive at a region of Phrygia. Their divine identities are a secret. Their divine identities are a secret. They receive hospitality and shelter only from Lot. They receive hospitality and shelter only from Bacchus and Philemon. Lot prepares a feast for the visitors. Bacchus and Philemon prepare a feast for the visitors. The visitors reveal their supernatural status by performing a miracle causing blindness. The visitors reveal their superhuman status by performing a miracle replenishing the wine. The visitors pronounce judgment on the rest of Sodom for its wickedness. The visitors pronounce judgment on the rest of the region for its wickedness. Lot and his family are granted immunity. Bacchus and Philemon are granted immunity. Lot and his family are told to flee to the hills or mountain. Bacchus and Philemon are told to flee to a mountain. The plain is destroyed in a natural disaster, a rain of fire. The plain is destroyed in a natural disaster, a flood. Lot's wife looks back to watch. Bacchus and Philemon look back to watch. Lot's wife undergoes a metamorphosis into a pillar of salt. Bacchus and Philemon undergo a metamorphosis into trees. There's a strange story in Judges 19 which carries similarities to Genesis 19 as highlighted by Paul Davidson. Davidson wonders if Genesis 19 combined the Hellenistic theophany concepts 
but ultimately sees one of these counts as copying the other. Look at this graph again, Genesis 19 with Sodom, Judges 19 with Gibeah. The visitors to Sodom intend to spend the night in the square. A Levite traveling with his concubine prepares to spend a night in the square in Gibeah. Lot, a foreigner residing in Sodom, puts them up in his house. An old man, a foreigner residing in Gibeah, puts the Levite and his concubine up in his house. A violent mob consisting of all the city's men surrounded the house and demand that the visitors be handed over so that we might know them. A violent mob of the city's men surrounded the house and demands that the Levite be handed over so that we might know him. Lot offers to hand over his virgin daughters instead. The master of the house offers to hand over his virgin daughter and the Levite's concubine instead. The mob refuses. The mob refuses. There's no parallel to the Genesis account, but the judges one says the Levite's concubine is handed over to the mob and she's raped and killed. Notice both the story in Genesis 19 and the tale of Philemon Bacchus share themes of divine judgment, and they both echo ancient flood stories from the Near East. For instance, in the Sodom story from Genesis 19, there are hints that link it to flood tales. Number one, the word rain is used when describing how God sent down fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah. Two, people are told to escape to the hills, which makes sense if you're trying to avoid rising waters. Number three, the city of Sodom and Gomorrah are said to be near the Dead Sea, a significant body of water. So these stories aren't just about punishment. They're also connected to ancient tales of massive floods. Many cultures have tales of massive floods. In the Bible, there's Noah's Ark. And in the Greek stories, there's the tale of Deucalion and Pyrrha. Interestingly, the famous ancient Greek writer Hesiod didn't mention the flood story. Some think he might have not even known about it, while others believe he chose to leave it out. M. L. West suggests that this flood story actually came from the East and was adapted to fit the Greek setting. So just like the story of Noah was reimagined in Greece with Deucalion as the central figure, the tale of Philemon and Bacchus in Phrygia could have borrowed elements from the biblical story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Both these tales talk about localized floods, making them a sort of spin-off from the bigger, more universal flood stories like Noah's and Deucalion's. I want to highlight that Ovid's major flood narrative is the Deucalion and Pyrrha stories in Book 1 of Ovid. In this cataclysmic flood account, these husband and wife recount that if one of them were to be swallowed up by the flood waters, the other would follow them to death. How would you feel now, poor soul, if the fates had willed you to be saved, but not me? How could you endure your fear alone? Who would comfort your tears? Believe me, dear wife, if the sea had you, I would follow you, and the sea would have me too. Ovid's Metamorphosis, Book 1. It's a love story inside of the flood myth, similar to the story of Philemon and Bacchus. Both stories highlight a temple or sanctuaries post-deluge. Ovid's Greek Genesis has Apollo chase Daphne in love with her, but she is transformed into a tree. Help me, Father. If your streams have divine powers, change me. Destroy this beauty that pleases too well. Her prayer was scarcely done when a heavy numbness seized her limbs. Then bark closed over her breasts. Her hair turned into leaves, her arms into branches, her feet so swift a moment ago stuck fast in slow-growing roots. Her face was lost in the canopy. Only her shining beauty was left. Ovid's Metamorphosis, Book 1. The same way one would expect the major Deucalion story, Ovid's Metamorphosis, Book 1, to be connected to the Philemon and Bacchus flood story in Book 8 of Ovid, I suggest the flood of Noah in Genesis 6-9 is connected to the rain of fire catastrophe in Lot, Genesis 18 and 19. H.T. Riley pointed out some interesting similarities between two stories, one where Philemon and Bacchus host gods Jupiter and Mercury, and another where Abraham and Sarah welcome three angels, as told in Genesis 18. In both tales, a kind-hearted couple welcomes mysterious powerful guests, setting the stage for later events where the wicked face consequences and the good-hearted are saved. Here's what the two stories have in common. One, a loving couple 
not realizing who their guests truly are, offers them a warm welcome. Two, both couples are older and don't have kids. Three, together the husband and wife whip up a hearty meal for their guests. Four, both stories have a touch of humor. There's laughter in the Genesis tale, while in the other there's a funny scene with a goose. Number five, sacred trees play a role in both stories. In Genesis, the couple meets their guest by some special trees. And in the other story, the couple turned into sacred trees at the end. Both the story in Genesis 18 and the tale of Bacchus and Philemon have shared elements, like washing the guest's feet and offering a meal, but there are five unique similarities between the two stories that suggest the Philemon and Bacchus tell might have been influenced by the Genesis account, though it could have been the other way around. Elements from the story in Genesis 18, where an elderly couple is visited by mysterious guest and promised a child, also appear in another tale called Hyreus Episode. In this story, an old man named Hyreus is also visited by a special guest and is miraculously promised a son, Orion. This tale of Orion's birth has been around for a long time. It can be traced back through Nicander's poetic predecessor, Antimachus of Caliphon, around 425 BCE. It's unclear when or how the story of Isaac's miraculous birth from Genesis or the miraculous birth of Orion influenced the other tale, but it's interesting to see these similarities. Dr. Philip Vajenbaum in his book, Argonauts of the Desert says it's improbable that Ovid drew from the Bible given its shift away from mythological themes. Conversely, the idea of the Bible adopting and then sanitizing Greek tales to align with Platonic ideals seems more plausible. This adaptation, however, seems limited to divine portrayals as the Bible doesn't shy away from human-centric tales, even if they're violent or shocking. His entire book is a collection of ideas which highlight several parallels to the Greek world from the Bible. Also, Russell Gamirkin may echo much of this sentiment of the biblical myths being inspired by the Greeks, as well as several Near Eastern myths. As far as parallels go with the Genesis account and Ovid, no such parallels are this close from any other theoxony or theodicy, meaning we have no other accounts in any written myth that come close to these stories as listed before. We can speculate on sources or speculate on which one was influenced by the other for whatever reasons one lists. It should be apparent that the Genesis stories are in the same category of genre as these other Greek and Roman sources. These are not history, but clever stories or myths. Those who try to act like Genesis is giving us history are completely blind to the realisms of these other myths. It's safe to say much of these Greek, Biblical, and Roman myth of Theoxony and Theodicy are influenced by Homer's Odyssey and Iliad. This is not to say other influences were not at play. In the New Testament, I see strange eclectic borrowing from the Septuagint or LXX scriptures and Greek and Roman ideas in Jesus' transfiguration scene. As mentioned in the Philemon and Bacchus story, they end up on a mountain before the god Jupiter, Zeus, granted them a wish. That wish was that they would serve the gods forever and not see their loved one's death. This wish was granted. The New Testament apostles expected immortality from Jesus and the soon apocalyptic end by fire mentioned by Jesus and other authors have connections to this transfiguration scene, which is a preview of Jesus' apotheosis, it seems. Peter speaks out of the three mortals on that high mountain about building tabernacles for these three, Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. It's clear that the author's modeling the scene off of the Moses story, but Jesus' clothes experience a metamorphosis. The other scene I find interesting was when Jupiter, in disguise, kept replenishing the wine so that they never ran out. While Dionysus is universally known to have transformed milk into wine and understood as the god of wine and drunkenness, this miracle in Ovid's story was the sign Bacchus and Philemon knew they were entertaining gods. Hopefully this will give you some context for why Jesus transformed water into wine per the Gospels. They want you to see him as a god. This one might be going out on a limb, but I noticed in the Noah and Lot catastrophes, both stories highlight how the survivor gets drunk off wine, and some weird family sexual act takes place while they are intoxicated. 
I'm reminded of Dionysus in these narratives, though a demythologized version of a Greek myth. This characteristic of the mundane, almost euhemerist angle. Euhemerism is the theory that gods arose out of the deification of historical heroes. This idea became very influential by Euhemerus, who lived in the late 4th century BCE, though the attempt to rationalize mythology in historical terms does have pedigree further back in history by Sankon Neathom, Xenophanes, Herodotus, Hecateus of Abdera, and Euphorus of Simi. The only remaining evidence of anything related to Sankaniathon, who wrote around 1200 BCE, is preserved in Eusebius, who is using Philo of Byblos as his source. Most scholars suggest that Philo of Byblos is Hellenizing his sources into Greek, giving them a rationalizing and euhemeristic slant. It seems the rationalizing of myths started with the Greeks, as far as we can assess on the evidence. This gives scholars who think the Bible borrowed from the Greeks good reason to think these Genesis narratives are rationalizing and bringing their highly mythological sources, Gilgamesh Epic, Enuma Elish, Egyptian mythologies, Odyssey, Iliad, Herodotus, and other sources down to earth in a way that gives it a more believable slant, unlike the Greek and Roman counterparts. It was Greek philosophers who rationalized their own myths, and maybe they brushed shoulders with the biblical authors. Of course, there are several other reasons why these Genesis authors may have borrowed from the Greeks instead of the other way around, but that will need to be tackled another day. Luke 24, A God in Disguise. Let's turn to a few interesting observations that I've made about Ovid's stories, Genesis, and the Gospels. Recent studies suggest that the authors of the Gospels, the books in the Bible that tell the story of Jesus, might have started with his sayings and then created stories around them. They could have pulled inspiration from many places, but not many people think they looked at ancient Greek stories, even though these were super popular at the time. However, the Gospel of Luke seems to be trying to appeal to a wider audience that would be familiar with these Greek tales. Some experts, like Bonds, think Luke's story stories have a lot in common with Greek epic poems. Early Christians even saw similarities between their stories and Greek myths. For example, in one part of the Bible, Paul visits Athens and talks about these connections. He talks about even your own poets have said in Acts 17. I believe that one part of Luke, which tells a post-resurrection story of Jesus, is actually inspired by the Greek epic, the Odyssey. The story has elements of gods visiting humans and moments of realization, which are common in Greek tales. It's interesting to note that stories about what happened after Jesus' resurrection seem to vary a lot. The earliest account by Paul has details that aren't in the later Gospels. Luke's version is unique and focuses more on Jesus' followers. It paints Jesus as a kind of philosopher whose teachings live on through his students. But there's a twist in Luke's story. A disciple named Cleopas, who doesn't appear anywhere else in the New Testament, plays a big role. He misunderstands Jesus' teachings and needs to be set straight. This is similar to a theme in Greek stories where a god in disguise corrects a human about divine matters. Again, Theoxony is a type of ancient story where a god disguises themselves as a stranger to see how they're treated by humans. It's a test of kindness and respect. There are two main types of these stories. In one, the guests are rude and end up angering the god, leading to some kind of disaster. In the other, everyone is nice and things go well. A famous example of the positive type is the ancient Greek story, the Odyssey. In it, a character named Nestor and his family are nice to a guest who turns out to be the goddess Athena in disguise. However, there's a twist in the Bible's version of this story in Luke 24. Here, Jesus appears to his followers. They don't recognize him. They just can't see him for who he is. This is a bit different from the usual theoxony, stories where the god changes their appearance. Almost most of these stories start with the guest arriving at someone's home. But in Luke, the story follows a pattern similar to another part of the Odyssey. In the Odyssey, a character named Telemachus realizes he had a god as a guest the day before. He prays to this god, and then the goddess Athena shows up, this time looking like someone else. She offers to help him on his journey. When they arrive at a place called Pylos, they're warmly welcomed by Nestor. Even though he's in the middle of a big ceremony for another god, he's a great host. Interestingly, he asks his guest who he thinks is just a regular person, but is actually Athena in disguise, to say a prayer. So in this story, a god ends up praying 
to another god. After a big ceremony, Nestor chats with his guests. In these types of stories, there's often a funny twist, where the audience knows a character is a god in disguise, but the other characters in the story don't. Nestor gives some advice to Telemachus, saying that since the goddess Athena helped his dad in the past, she might help him too. The funny part? Nestor doesn't realize that one of his guests is actually Athena in disguise. Telemachus, not knowing Athena is right next to him, doubts that the gods would help. Athena, not letting this slide, makes a playful joke using Telemachus's name, reminding him that gods can help from afar. Now, let's think about another common theme in the Odyssey. A lot of the story is about waiting for someone to come home after a long time away. When they finally reunite, it's super emotional. Before the big reunion, there are moments where people talk about the missing person not realizing he's right there with them. This leads to some touching scenes where they finally recognize him. The cool thing about the Odyssey is that the main character, Odysseus, often hides his identity on purpose to see if people are loyal to him. It's like a surprise test. In Luke 24, there's a cool twist similar to some moments in the Odyssey. Two disciples, Cleopas and another unnamed one, are walking and chatting about recent events. Suddenly, Jesus, who has just been resurrected, joins them. But here's the twist. They don't recognize him. When Jesus asks what they're talking about, Cleopas is surprised, saying, You must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about what's happened recently. It's pretty funny, because Jesus is actually the main character in those events. It's like when someone talks about a celebrity, not realizing that celebrity is right next to them in disguise. Now, who's this Cleopas guy? Some people try to find a real life person he might be based on, but that might be missing the point. His name gives us a hint. Cleopas is a shorter version of a common Greek name, Cleopatras. This name has parts that mean fame or glory and father. So Cleopas name might mean the father's glory. It's like when characters in stories have names that hint at their role or personality. And just like in those stories, everyone in this one probably knows what Cleopas's name means. Later on, Jesus uses a word that means glory in a conversation, tying it all together. Cleopas was chatting with Jesus, though he didn't recognize him, and mentioned how he had hoped Jesus would have been the one to save Israel. He knew about some claims that Jesus had been seen after his death, but he wasn't entirely convinced. This situation is a bit like a scene from the Odyssey. Just as a character named Telemachus was doubtful about the god's power and got corrected by Athena, Jesus now sets Cleopas straight. And just like Athena made a playful comment about Telemachus's name, Jesus does something similar with Cleopas. Jesus points out that it was essential for him to suffer before achieving glory. It's like he's saying, hey, Mr. Glory of the Father, I had to go through all that to reach my true glory. This kind of scene where a divine guest corrects someone who doesn't recognize them is also in Genesis 18, where Sarah overhears a stranger saying she'll have a son within a year. She laughs because she's way past the age of having kids. But the stranger, who's actually divine, hears her and asks why she laughed, reminding her that nothing's impossible for God. When she does have a son, he's named Isaac, which sounds like the Hebrew word for laugh. But the writer of Luke might not have known this detail since it's not in the Greek version of the story. Jesus in the story emphasizes that the Messiah, a savior figure, had to go through tough times. This idea wasn't common in old religious texts, but interestingly, there's a similar theme in the ancient Greek epic, the Odyssey. The hero Odysseus is told by the goddess Athena that he'll face many challenges. The way Jesus and Odysseus are described is strikingly similar, hinting that the writers might have been inspired by the same themes. Fast forward in the story, when Jesus and his two friends reach a place called Emmaus, they ask him to stay with them. This is where things get interesting. They offer him food, a classic move in ancient stories when a mysterious guest, often a god in disguise, shows up. This kind of story is so common that it has its own name. Theoxeny. And just like in many of these stories, Jesus, even though they don't know he's divine, takes the lead. He says a blessing and breaks the bread for them. This moment is a lot like a scene in the Odyssey where Athena, in disguise, says a prayer during a big feast. The similarities between these two stories are hard to miss. In the story, there's a moment when the friends suddenly realize who their guest really is. It's Jesus. 
but the story doesn't go into detail about how they figured it out. It's more about them believing than actually seeing. This twist in the story is similar to a classic move in the ancient Greek epic, The Odyssey. The hero Odysseus hides his true identity from even his closest friends and family to test their loyalty. It's like when someone wears a disguise in a movie and their best friend can't recognize them. The Odyssey has many moments like this. For instance, when Odysseus is with a group called the Phaeacians, a singer sings songs about Odysseus's adventures, but no one realizes he's right there in the room. Then, just as they figure out it's Jesus, he vanishes out of thin air. This sudden disappearance is also a classic move from ancient stories. In the Odyssey, the goddess Athena does the same thing. She'll be talking to someone and then poof, she's gone. And all that's left is a bird flying away. It's like a magical exit. This kind of dramatic exit is used in the story to leave the audience in awe and wonder. In closing, the narrative's parallels between Genesis and ancient Greek myths are truly fascinating. While the direction of influence remains debated, these literary overlaps illuminate the shared storytelling heritage of the ancient Mediterranean world. By analyzing Ovidian episodes like Philemon and Bacchus and the Hyrieus myth alongside the biblical accounts of Lot and Abraham, we gain insight into the literary tropes and folkloric motifs captivated ancient audiences. The prevalence of theoxenic tales underscores the value placed on hospitality and antiquity, and the transformation motifs reveal a poetic flair for surprise twists. While some staunchly defend the originality of biblical texts, I believe we do the authors a disservice by ignoring the wider literary context. These stories didn't emerge in a vacuum. As people of faith, acknowledging the human hand and compiling holy scriptures need not undermine their power, but failing to recognize the humanity embedded in our religious heritage breeds rigidity and stagnation. My hope is that analyzing myths across cultures enriches our understanding of shared hopes, fears, and curiosities that have gripped the human imagination for millennia. Our distant ancestors spun wondrous stories by firelight, imagining gods wandering among mortals. And we in turn pick up these myths, tracing the threads between civilizations, realizing anew our common humanity across the ages. Therein lies the real magic. Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell. Comment your favorite part of this video, like the video, and join our Patreon and YouTube membership to be part of the family and access exclusive content. Never forget, we are Myth Vision.